Good evening. This is the very first event in Scotland in the campaign to get justice for Julian Assange. The WikiLeaks founder has been held in the high security prison uh, Belmarsh in London as US authorities try to extradite him on so-called hacking and espionage charges. Too many journalists are being locked up around the world today for doing nothing more than their job, and Julian Assange is one. Tonight we get an opportunity to examine his case as seen through the eyes of uh, those who know him or know of him. And we have an excellent um, panel with us. Uh, first is Stella Morris, the partner of Julian Assange, who should be able to give us no doubt an insight into the man behind the celebrity um, headlines. Joining us also is George Caravan, the former editor of the Scotsman and columnist for The National, who will be giving us his perspective, no doubt, um, of Assange the journalist. Tommy Shepherd, SNP MP, needs no introduction, and I'm sure he can give us the political perspective to this uh, case of injustice and someone with another insider perspective is Kristen Hrathnan and I've probably mangled that, I do apologise uh, Kristen. Um, she is the uh, WikiLeaks Editor-in-Chief. Uh, my name is Yvonne Ridley and I'm an author and journalist and I will be chairing tonight's meeting. Each panellist will speak for around 10 minutes in the order that I've introduced them. And then any questions that uh, those of you online have, please leave them in the chat function and we will address each one. Uh, but let's start first possibly with the best person to give us a personal insight to Julian Assange tonight. And uh, that is Stella Morris. So um, Stella, if you can uh, uh, give us your uh, insight and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, well, Julian is uh, my fiance, the father of, of my children, uh, but I've also followed his case for much longer. I've known him for, for uh, 10 years now. And um, for as long as I've known him, he has been under some form of uh, deprivation of liberty or another. He was already uh, under house arrest when I first met him. And it's hard to cast your mind back uh, perhaps to 2010 and to actually understand that Julian hasn't been a free man uh, for 11 years soon to be. Uh, and over the past 11 years, his uh, deprivation of liberty has grown uh, more and more uh, confining to the extent that he is now in a uh, tiny prison cell in Britain's worst prison. And he's not there as a convicted prisoner. He is a uh, remand prisoner. And he's only there for the single reason that the US uh, are trying to extradite him on a completely bogus case, which criminalizes uh, journalism, a very dangerous case not only in the United States, States, but also in the United Kingdom. Because what it does is it uh, describes journalistic practices, specifically receiving, possessing, and communicating information that is true to the public. And there's no denial that this information that he published was in the public interest. There's no denial that he received that from a journalistic source. Chelsea Manning, who was convicted uh, to 35 years and then uh, whose sentence was commuted uh, in 2016 by President Obama. Basically, what they've had to do is criminalize journalism. And this is something that the Obama administration refused to do. In 2013, they, uh, the Obama administration actually announced that it was not going to prosecute Julian over the Manning leaks. Uh, because if they did, they would be setting a precedent for the rest of uh, the journalistic community. 
And this changed under the Trump administration. Julian was only indicted uh, by the United States under Trump. And that is because uh, there was a confluence of interest in, under Trump. Uh, WikiLeaks published uh, the most significant uh, publication leak from, from the CIA uh, under the Trump administration called Vault 7. And it also exposed uh, US interference in the French elections of 2012 uh, as soon as Trump came into office. So as soon as Trump came into office, there was these massive exposures and especially the CIA uh, under uh, Mike Pompeo became uh, hellbent on getting Julian and destroying WikiLeaks. And you have the CIA on the one hand, and then you had Trump who had his war on journalism. And these two interests uh, converged. And so what was called the New York Times problem until that point, we don't want to prosecute Assange because that would be criminalizing journalism, then became actually a solution to going after journalists criminally. And so they, they went after uh, Julian with a, an indictment uh, that was sealed in 2018. And then a number of uh, very uh, shady developments occurred while he was inside the embassy, spying on his legal meetings, uh, targeting our six month old child, um, plots to kill and kidnap Julian inside the embassy. All of this has come out after Julian was uh, taken from the embassy and a vicious uh, media campaign from some quarters uh, to smear Julian and uh, all, these, all this to create a climate in which Julian could be extradited, uh, extradited ultimately, but arrested from the embassy and his political asylum um, outrageously withdrawn in violation of, of international law. Once he was arrested on the 11th of April, 2019, he was taken to Belmarsh prison and uh, that's where he remains two and a half, almost two and a half years later, uh, wanted by the US on this outrageous case where he uh, risks a 175 year prison sentence for essentially uh, what is acts of journalism. And whereas uh, it is often described as him being accused of hacking and of espionage, when you look at the actual accusations, these are not at all what he's being accused of. He's being accused under the Espionage Act, yes, but the Espionage Act doesn't uh, just cover espionage. It is literally what he is being accused of is not spying for a foreign na nation. It is literally receiving, possessing, and communicating to the public information that is in the public interest. And it's such a broad um, act that you can, if, if the political decision is taken to use to instrumentalize this act in this way, which is what the Trump administration did, uh, then yes, the wording allows for it. Um, and so he's not accused of espionage per se, he's accused of journalism under an espionage uh, statute. And then in relation to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, the so called single hacking charge, um, if you look at the relative weight of the of the um, accusations, this computer charge is just a single charge of five years. Uh, the rest is Espionage Act, receiving, um, possessing, communicating information to the public. And that is 170 years. The computer charge is just a PR ploy because when you, when you look at the details of the computer charge, it is a uh, in relation to Manning, uh, 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 they say a conspiracy to um, decipher a, a, a hash, which isn't a password. It's a. It's basically a mathematical um, um, calculation. Uh, it's not illegal to to try to decipher to uh, um, crack a hash because a hash can be a hash of anything, and. Uh, without going into too much detail, uh, we basically obliterated that uh, claim, that charge, with our forensic evidence back in February uh, 2020. And then what the US did was try to beef up this computer charge uh, with some 
uh, additional allegations from a certain um, witness in Iceland. Uh, and now that witness just a week ago has recanted and uh, acknowledged that he lied to U.S. prosecutors in exchange for for, uh, for uh, immunity from from U.S. prosecution. So I know that Kristen Kristen will speak a little bit to that major development, but it's just to explain that the U.S. case is completely bogus, and what it comes down to is criminalizing journalism and the most important journalism. Uh, some of the most important publications that there have been in modern journalistic history, evidence of war crimes, evidence of Reuters journalists being gunned down in cold blood in Baghdad, uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, evidence uh, of CIA rendition and torture, evidence that has then been used in court cases in order to gain uh, redress uh, from uh, these, these abuses and uh, complicity by US, uh, by European states with CIA rendition. For example, the scale is just so massive of these publications that you can only just touch on some anecdotes, but they're so significant. People have been um, freed from prison because their innocence has, have been, has been proven. Uh, the US troops, uh, were were no longer granted immunity in Iraq as a result of WikiLeaks publications. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the US uh, withdrew the majority of its group troops from Iraq in 2011. So the impact is just enormous. And that is what uh, the US is vengeful over. And Trump's, uh, Trump's attempt to criminalize uh, press freedom, to criminalize uh, journalism is now um, continuing under the Biden administration. And so it's completely outrageous and it's also uh, extremely dangerous for the UK because it's an extradition case, because the, U the UK and the US, um, the US has to argue that these are equivalent charges to what exists in the UK. And so aspects of the Official Secrets Act that have not been tested before are now being harmonized through Julian's case in order to argue that he should be extradited. Mm -hmm. Right, well, thank you uh, very much for, uh, for that, uh, Stella. And I would like to invite uh, George now the, um, to give his perspective. Uh, drawing on his experience as former associate editor of the Scotsman and columnist for the National. Um, so um, I think we're all looking forward to hear what you have to say, George. Um, good evening, folks. Uh, just at the very beginning, uh, Yvonne um, elevated me to the, uh, the editor of the Scotsman. Um, uh, I was just one rung below that uh, uh, because Andy Neal, the famous Andrew Brewer Neal, um, now of GB News, um, would never let me get near the editorial chair. Um, uh, Julian is charged under the infamous Espionage Act, American Espionage Act of 1917, probably the most notorious piece of legislation uh, in American history. Uh, which was, has been systematically used over the years to go after anybody who threatened the American state. Um, it was used against Eugene V. Debs, American um, uh, socialist, famous socialist, Emma Goldman, uh, Julian and Ethel Rosenberg were fried, sent to, the, uh, to, to be executed under the act. In the 50s, Daniel Ellsberg, who leaked the Pentagon Papers um, during the Vietnam War, uh, was pursued under the Espionage Act, uh, latterly Edward Snowden, uh, and it's been very heavily used over the last decade, last 10 years, uh, under the, the infamous uh, War Against Terror to go against uh, any American uh, leaker who got in the way of the administration. Um, now, the, the important thing to understand about the Espionage Act uh, is that it's been used over the decades against 
uh, people within the administration or the military or the American civil service who did the leaking to journalists. It can be and is open to be used against journalists, but the political balance of forces in America has always meant that administrations have retreated from going the extra mile and actually banging up journalists. Um, so though um, uh, the, the case was, if you've seen the movie, uh, the case was made against the New York Times and the, the Washington uh, Journal uh, over the Pentagon Papers. Ultimately, um, none of the famous journalists who, who did the leaking um, were actually, um, uh, actually prosecuted. Uh, the administrations didn't feel they had uh, uh, the political weight to pursue the journalists as such, so they went for the leakers. What is important about the case of Julian Assange is that the American administration, um, uh, Trump before, but it uh, looks like Biden, the uh, so-called arch-liberal now, is trying to move the goalposts and get a situation where they can pursue the journalists who do the actual publication of the leaked material. And why they picked on Julian Assange is, of course, um, we are in the new era of the internet, uh, and uh, the, the administration in America thinks that by pursuing Assange and WikiLeaks, it can open up a front to take on journalists and leave print journalists like myself. Um, on the side. But this is a wedge. It's a dangerous wedge to take the, 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 this ancient piece of notorious legislation further in the 21st century and use it against people on the internet. Now, we've got examples of that going on everywhere, including in Scotland, which is, which is why I'm passionate about this. Uh, here in Scotland, um, there is a blogger called Craig Murray, um, who has been charged and found guilty of contempt of court. Um, for, um, we won't go into the details, but um, essentially for um, uh, uh, publishing material on the internet, which the courts deem he should, he should not have done. But if you look at the judgment against Craig Murray, uh, the judgment is very, is, makes the point clear that Craig Murray is not a proper journalist. He's not a print journalist, therefore not a proper journalist. He has leaked uh, uh, information on the internet. And Craig Murray's case is now at the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom, it is that important. Um, if anything, uh, Julian Assange's case is even more important than Craig Murray's, um, because if, it, if he is successfully uh, extradited and successfully prosecuted under the, the um, uh, Espionage Act, it opens up on a global scale the ability of the Americans to pursue, the American administrations, to pursue journalists, uh, um, modern journalists through the internet. And once they've done that, of course, all journalists, including print journalists, uh, are up for grabs. So if they come for Julian, they'll come for the rest of us. Now, um, there's been much effort to um, denigrate Julian Assange as a, as a human being and a person, and is under a huge character assassination over, the, over the, the last decade. I don't care whether you don't like Julian Assange. The point has nothing to do with whether you like Julian Assange or what his character is. The point is he is a test to allow the extension of the Espionage Act and the extension in America and in Britain, uh, of limitations on journalistic freedom to report. First, by extending that to the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the net sphere, to journalists who blog, by denigrating them as non-journalists. And once you've achieved that, then you can proceed to take on every journalist. So we have to protect this test case. We have to protect Julian. Now, again, let me stress, Julian Massage, has been, uh, has been to court, and the British courts have rejected the American claim to have him extradited. And as we know, the, 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 the rules on extraditing uh, individuals from, from Britain to, to America are extremely loose uh, from here to there, not the other way around. Um, uh, so it takes a lot for the British uh, legal system to block an American uh, demand for extradition. Um, but they have. The Americans are now... Um, slowly, lethargically appealing this, which is why Julian is banged up uh, in the ultra-security wing of Belmarsh, which is outrageous. He's not allowed to meet MPs. MPs are not allowed to talk to and visit uh, elected members. They're not allowed to visit uh, Julian Assange. I mean, that, that's extraordinary. Um, now, um, I just let me finish by saying this. Um, uh, 
we in Europe have a have a kind of tendency to think that that we're nicer over here, things are better over here. And it's the Americans who are are the danger. If anything, the trait of being a journalist in Europe uh, is more dangerous than it is in America. This week, um, Peter de Vries in the Netherlands, uh, a very well-known uh, investigative journalist, was shot in the head and is clinging to life uh, for, for doing investigative reporting into organized crime in the Netherlands. Um, Daphne uh, Corana Galicia uh, was murdered for doing exactly the same thing in Malta. I've been to Malta. Uh, I've been involved in, in taking up her case. Um, Veronica Gorin in Ireland uh, in, in, at the end of the 1990s, again, was murdered uh, for doing um, investigative journals. In those three cases, in a lot of cases in Europe, it is organized crime that is murdering journalists. Let me explain this. Organized crime does not exist persistently unless there's a major failure by the police. Um, we've already had the Metropolitan Police uh, quite rightly being condemned uh, uh, over the last month for being institutionally um, corrupt in this country. Um, organized crime does not exist over the decades unless there is some degree of complicity and corruption within the local police forces. And that extends to uh, uh, a cover for journalists being murdered. So do not think that in, in Europe we somehow live in some land of, of liberty and it's the Americans that are the problem. Journalism has to be defended in this is in Europe, in Britain, uh, and in America. And the, the 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 crucial front line is stopping Julian Assange being extradited to America and having the uh, Espionage Act extended through his prosecution to cover um, those who print and publish uh, the material the United States wants to cover up. Um, for those of you who, like me, support Scottish independence and, and um, uh, and uh, uh, Tommy, uh, I look forward to an independent scholar actually uh, introducing tougher, tougher rules that allow journalists to do their, do their business, trade their trade, and to stop the kind of illegal interference in journalism that we've seen in the attempt over a whole decade to keep um, uh, Julian Assange from telling the truth. This is an ongoing fight, uh, but here's the front line. So I want everyone to get involved in Julian being um, uh, uh, sent back to America. Well, thank you uh, for those excellent points, George. And, um, you know, it's true, like him or loathe him, uh, this is about freedoms and liberties, and they should not be offered indiscriminately like random bits of um, sweets on a pick and mix stall. So um, thank you uh, for those. The next speaker for the don't extradite uh, Assange campaign is uh, um, Tommy Shepherd, um, SNP MP. And um, we'd really like to hear your political perspective, uh, Tommy. And I, one of the questions I was going to ask you uh, later was, um, have you had a chance to visit uh, Julian Assange? But George has just pointed out that um, uh, no visitors, uh, certainly not MPs, uh, are allowed to, um, to meet with him. So if I can uh, open the floor to you now, Tommy. Uh, thanks, Yvonne, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here and to lend my support to tonight's event, which I, I hope will be the start of trying to build this campaign in Scotland and having a distinctively Scottish focus both uh, here today and what uh, we can do uh, within uh, the current constitutional setup, but also, as George says, to set markers for how these things ought to be conducted by a decent society in the future in an independent Scotland. Um, I, I'm one of a, a small but, but increasing number of members of parliament at Westminster uh, across the political spectrum who are trying to raise awareness of the case and to support the campaign to have the charges dropped and to have Julian released. Um, we've been doing a, a, a number of things. Uh, uh, you're right, we have tried to arrange um, a, a visit uh, with Julian Assange, and we've tried to do that uh, uh, virtually because of the, the COVID restrictions and been denied that. We initially pursued that through 
the Justice Department and were then told that they couldn't do it. it would, we would have to make the application through the governor of Belf Belmarsh. And myself and 17 other MPs have written to the governor uh, demanding to have access, uh, the money that he facilitate uh, such a meeting uh, with, with Julian Assange. And we have been, uh, you know, well, we, we have not yet had a positive request. We will continue to press uh, to press that case. We've done a number of other things as well. We've written to, uh, we wrote to Joe Biden prior to his trip uh, to, to this country last month to try and demand that uh, the US uh, drop uh, all their, their, their current legal action uh, against Julian and put an end to the matter. Um, I have to say, I, I just find it increasingly uh, monstrous what is happening and, and, and you know, really quite outrageous. Uh, this is a man who has been in jail now for coming up to two years without trial or conviction. Uh, he's been held uh, in a, a, an arbitrary fashion uh, pending the, the, you know, the, 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 the satisfying the, the aspirations or the whims of, of a, a foreign government who wished to try and prosecute him. I mean, we, would, we, we ought to be shocked and concerned about anyone being held for two years without trial, but all the more so when it is someone who is explicitly being held because they have been instrumental in publishing information which, a, which, part, you know, which the rich and powerful have found inconvenient uh, and embarrassing. And I don't want to repeat what's already been said, but I think the thing that we have to stress again and again is that Julian Assange didn't leak anything. His crime is to publish. Uh, the other people did the leaking and provided the information, and indeed their case has now come to a, a conclusion. He was the one who took information which was leaked to him and decided to communicate it to others by doing what journalists always do, which is to publish information in a free uh, world. And if he's not allowed to do that, then the world is no longer free and we needn't uh, kid ourselves that we live in some sort of free and democratic society. So that is why it is so important that we defend this case. And I agree with what George just said. I, I think the, you know, the, uh, the British state and, and the British media have done a remarkable job in trying to demonize Julian Assange. It has been a, you know, a monstrous character assassination. And we do have to say that it, it doesn't really matter what you think of this person as an individual. What you have to consider are the political implications of what is happening to him and the fact that if they get away with it with regard to Julian Assange, then others will be coming next. And at the moment, he is very much a, a whipping boy, it seems to me, for the political right in this country and in, in, in the States. And we should not allow him to remain in that position one moment longer and allow them to indulge themselves in treating them in the manner in which they do. So I think, you know, the time has come to try and rapidly run through the gears in this campaign and to try and get a lot more people involved and a lot more people aware. I, I mean, I have to admit that I, I am, and I'm, uh, perhaps I'm guilty of this myself. It's only in the last uh, nine months or so that I, I, I've, I've actually become involved. It is remarkable when you consider, uh, you know, how many elected members there are and how many activists we have, that there is, there is not more outcry and more activity in, in this case. It seems to have been, you know, it's treated extremely passively by, by many people. I think perhaps some people have, have forgotten about it and think that it's already been dealt with and, and they, don't, they don't realize that he is still incarcerated and the matter is still pending. So I, I, I do think we have uh, an effort and a challenge on our hands to try and encourage people not to agree with the case that we're making, because I think intellectually, most people on the on the centre left and left of the political spectrum, and, and indeed others on the libertarian range of the spectrum, will agree instinctively with the case that we're making, but to get them to prioritise it and to get them to actually make it a priority to take action on this and not to let it be swept under the carpet, not to let it 
dissipate and 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 be, become something that is regarded as you know the, the last decade's uh, campaign. So I'm happy to do what I can. Uh, I, I and and I, I uh, you know I'm an SNP politician, but it, I think it's vital that we work cross party in this. And I hope that we can engage uh, Liberal Democrat and Green and Labour people, and indeed some Conservatives. Uh, such you know, David Davis has been supporting this campaign at Westminster. Uh, because there is no reason why this should be a political issue. I think anyone who is concerned about protecting and extending the freedoms that we have uh, needs to stand up now and speak out on this issue and needs to lend their support to this campaign. So I hope this is the beginning uh, of work that we will undertake over the weeks and months ahead, which will lead to his release before very much longer. Well, I think we can all agree on that. And, you know, um if you, it, it isn't a political party issue because if you believe in freedom, then you should want it for everyone and vigorously defend everyone's rights to enjoy freedom. It's not a luxury item for the chosen few. So thank you, uh, Tommy, um, for those words. And um, we look forward to see the campaign grow, not only in Westminster among the other um, MPs, but uh, in Scotland as well, which uh, always punches well above its weight on matters of uh, freedoms and liberties. Now, our next panellist, and apologies for the gender mix-up, uh, Kristen. <laughs> um, our next uh, panellist is uh, Kristen Hrafnitsen, um, the WikiLeaks editor-in-chief, who I'm sure can um, give us um, some more incentives for campaigning in support of uh, the defence of um, not to um, extradite Julian Assange, um, or for short, it's the DEA campaign. Um, so, uh, Kristen, you have the floor. Apologies in advance for um, probably uh, scrunching up your um, the pronunciation of your last name, but um, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Yvonne, and uh, uh, no hard feelings for the gender mix. Uh, an email I'm very fond of, actually, is from uh, a years back when I was uh, uh, in the role of a spokesperson for WikiLeaks, and uh, uh, and I got an email from uh, a Danish journalist who addressed me as uh, dear Miss Rapson. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty used to that, and I'm, uh, it's, it's quite okay. Uh, I am an Icelandic journalist uh, for... 20 years before joining WikiLeaks 10 years ago. I'm, I'm very much from the mainstream media environment uh, in my home country. And I uh, actually uh, got to know Julian when, when he was visiting Iceland in 2010, 29 and 2010, uh, spending some time in my home country and actually advising and helping out uh, policymakers and uh, MPs in Iceland in revising journalists' laws, laws on whistleblowers, etc. So uh, we got to know each other at that point, and uh, he shared with me the uh, collateral murder video, which I instantly offered to, to work on as a media partner in my role then as working for the Icelandic State Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, it was a shocking revelation, the shooting down of Reuters journalists and innocent civilians in Baghdad. Uh, I think it's iconic and uh, just in itself is has painted the picture of, uh, of our perception of the Iraq war. I have often equated that with the, the, the infamous picture of the Napalm girl in Vietnam. Uh, the collateral murder video is the Iraq war in my mind. And I traveled to about that. I met the relatives of those killed, the innocent children who were wounded, who lost their father, who was a uh, uh, an innocent man who just was, was trying to help a, a wounded Reuters journalist. It was a very uh, touching experience for me, and uh, and I saw the uh, the power of this new expansion of journalism that Julian was introducing through WikiLeaks, and uh, this this scientific journalistic approach that it entailed, uh, giving the raw material to the people, uh, giving people full access to the truth. Uh, it was an incredibly powerful tool, and uh, 
a much needed one 10 years ago and uh, I will say a very much needed one today as well because uh, frankly this century has been a slippery slope downhill for journalism. Uh, we are seeing increased secrecy everywhere uh, by those who hold power, whether it's government or corporations. And we need, as citizens and as journalists, powerful counter tools to actually do our part and what is our duty to uh, hold those in power accountable. Now, the case against Julian Assange is probably, and I and I am absolutely certain of that, it is the worst attack on press freedom in my lifetime in our part of the world. It entails such a severe attack on press freedom that if we don't take firm action to uh, counter it and stop it, it will have extremely grave consequences. We are seeing here uh, a publisher, uh, a journalist being attacked for the first time uh, by the United States government uh, with the Espionage Act. Previously, they were using it or abusing that act, as was pointed out by my former speakers here, uh, against whistleblowers uh, in, 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 uh, in increasing uh, capacity. We were saying at that time, watch out because this will journalists will be next and julian was saying that and indeed he then became the first journalist and publisher to be attacked with this uh, uh, archaic and very dangerous legal tool in this lawfare that he has been uh, uh, suffering from and uh, having to fight for 10 years now almost 11. Uh, we are talking about uh, 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 a former, uh, a powerful nation who is, has deemed that they have uh, a universal reach. They are indicting uh, a Australian journalist who published his work not in the United States but in Britain, in Germany, in Sweden, and in my home country in Iceland. If we allow this to go on and go further, it means that any journalist anywhere in the world is not safe. If any journalist anywhere in the world will publish something that the United States government, uh, the superpower deems is against their interest, they will go after that individual, seek extradition, even rendition, what have you. So the severity of this case is, uh, obvious to those who have looked in, into it. And uh, there is no coincidence that uh, all organizations that do care about freedom of speech and freedom of the press, whether it's Reporters Without Borders, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all organizations of merit have joined together in condemning this uh, attack uh, on Julian Assange and urge the Biden administration to drop the case against him and the UK judiciary to uh, to stop the extradition of Julian Assange to the United States. Which the courts, of course, have, have decided uh, uh, in his favor. Let's not forget the victory that Julian had in January, January 4th, where uh, uh, Judge Vanessa Baritzer decided in his favor and uh, uh, declared that he should not be extradited. Uh, we have now had to, to wait for six months and a day for the High Court to decide whether an appeal is granted. Meanwhile, Julian Assange is sitting in Belmarsh prison. That, of course, is an abuse in itself for an individual to have to sit and wait for half a year for that simple decision of whether an appeal is granted or not. But it's, it doesn't come as a surprise. The, the tactic is well known. It's, st it's stalling, it's dragging this out as long as possible to uh, make Julian uh, suffer as much as possible. That is the lawfare that is being used against him. That is the, uh, the criminality in the at the core of this case, that is the torture 
that was recognized by Niels Melzer, the Special Rapporteur on Torture of the United Nations, who has come fully on board uh, and, and, and uh, uh, fought for Julian's cause because he has recognized uh, the severity of the situation and uh, the uh, abuse against his human rights. Now, we call ourselves lucky to be in uh, living in democratic countries with relatively good press freedoms, uh, and our governments are uh, um, banging their breasts and, and uh, criticizing human rights abuses in uh, faraway countries. They are criticizing uh, a, a lack of press freedom in faraway countries. But how hollow is that argument? How hollow is that when we have a publisher and a journalist sitting in the Southeast London prison, the worst prison in the United Kingdom, a terrorism, a t terrorist prison cell uh, where he has been sitting for more than two years now, a free man, a remand prisoner. It is outrageous. And while he is in jail, while he is still fighting that legal battle, the United Kingdom has no ground, and the government in London has no ground to uh, criticize other governments for attack on press freedom. The United States has no ground to criticize other countries for lack of human rights when they are pursuing him in this manner, while they are going after him in uh, not a, a prosecution, but a persecution. So, and, and let's, let's be sure about that. This has been noted by the uh, nefarious parties in other countries where democracy is, is, is either very tainted or, or non-existent. Uh, the Chinese foreign spokesperson recently claimed in an interview, why are you criticizing Ox over Hong Kong when you have Julian Assange's prison? Uh, we have uh, the president of Azerbaijan saying the same thing in an interview with CNN. We have uh, the uh, Russian ambassador in, in London on the Andrew Marshall saying basically, why are you criticizing us for Navalny? We're just doing the same thing that you were doing to Julian Assange. So increasingly, it's becoming obvious that this cannot go on. It's a very, very serious issue that have to, uh, have to be concerned by everyone. And everyone has to take part in striking this down. It is about Julian Assange, but it's not just about Julian Assange. It's about a, a bigger picture, about a press freedom, about our future and our children's future. That is the case. It is becoming apparent to more and more people. Two years ago, when Julian Assange was removed from the embassy in, in London, the Ecuadorian embassy, the, the smearing campaign against him had been so hideous, so extraordinary, that I don't think anything like it has happened in uh, a Western country, at least since not since the uh, the, the, the 60s, when the uh, the FBI actually had a, a program where they had such smearing campaigns against uh, uh, Martin Luther King and, and, and other who were fighting for human rights. Uh, it was extraordinary to witness that for us who knew, know Julian Assange. And uh, it has been said here by a couple of people, you don't have to like Julian Assange. Well, I do like him. He's an extraordinary person. And the depiction of him in the media two years ago was, was so outrageous that I will have a very difficulty in trusting my colleagues in journalism after that, after they echoed this kind of uh, uh, abuse against an individual. I depicted him as almost a monster. It was... It, it's extraordinary that this could happen in our time and in, 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 in my lifetime to witness that. And that is a, a totally different category that actually journalists will have to come to terms with at some point in our history, because we are on the right side of history. And the United States government is actually on the run. They don't have a case. They don't have a case that has legs to stand on. It's just... It's hollow, as, as Stella mentioned earlier. They are so desperate to um, build a case against Julian that they even sought, sought out a, 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 a countryman of, of mine, a volunteer for a brief period in 2010, 2011, 
and uh, used his testimony uh, to underpin uh, the so-called hacking chart. The hacking chart is a PR uh, plot, as, as Stella mentioned. It entails that uh, the accusation that Julian somehow conspired with Chelsea Manning in acquiring information, that he was a co-conspirator. They had nothing to back that up. As Stella mentioned, they had uh, a conversation allegedly between Julian and Chelsea Manning about uh, cracking a hash code, which is not even a password. And uh, forensic experts were in court in London basically showing that this would not even have given Chelsea Manning access to computer with any national secrets. The, the, probably the issue was here that the, uh, she, as, as other uh, uh, servicemen in the military in the desert in Iraq, were trying to download videos and music to uh, kill time. So, and the other 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 sort of argument that they 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 used in the, the original indictment was that uh, uh, allegedly Julian told Chelsea Manning, "quote." Uh, curious eyes never run dry, in my experience, unquote. Now, <laughs> that is the allegation of conspiracy. A journalist telling the source, quote, curious eyes never dr run dry, in my experience, unquote. It, and it's repeatedly cited in the indictment as the uh, incriminating evidence that Julian is, is not a journalist, but he was actively involved in some criminal activity. Of course, everybody sees how ridiculous this is. And of course, the United States lawyers saw that last year after the first part of the proceedings in London. This would not hold water anywhere in court. And what did they do? They turned to this former volunteer who was uh, working for in, in a limited capacity for WikiLeaks. 10 years ago, and abused that activity by uh, basically going rogue and stealing money from WikiLeaks. When I, we found out that uh, he was about, he was, he had been stealing money proceeds from uh, um, online sales of merchandise uh, to support the organization and actually fabricating an email, falsifying an email from Julian Assange to uh, uh, allow to, to, uh, to, uh, to direct to the, the funds from those and the proceeds to go to his personal bank account, he decided to become uh, an FBI informant and contacted the U.S. Embassy. This happened in 2010. Uh, in 2013 and 2014, that individual had been sentenced in court for not just stealing from WikiLeaks, but from uh, two dozen organizations and individuals. Massive frauds on a massive scale. He was also he was also charged and sentenced in court for uh, sexually abusing nine underage boys. Now we we had at that point thought we knew that he was collaborating with the FBI and the Department of Justice, and we thought, well, for heaven's sake, this is not a, a, a witness in in a case that we don't we have to worry about with that track record. But the Trump's Department of Justice thought otherwise. So after Julian Assange was arrested uh, and, and the indictment was uh, uh, unsealed and published, they went back to that witness and they offered to that witness uh, 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 an immunity deal in exchange for uh, bearing witness against Julian. And in the midst of the proceeding, and actually just, uh, I think, two or three weeks before the second uh, half of the proceedings in London last uh, fall, uh, an, an updated indictment was presented. It was, uh, and it had entailed uh, very serious allegations uh, based solely on this witness. Uh, allegations that Julian had instructed him to uh, 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 hack into computers to gain access to telephone conversations of members of parliament in my home country, uh, to uh, decrypt the stolen bank, docu bank documents, and what have you. Now, they were so desperate that they used this individual in his testimony, and they put it into the indictment, and 
it had an effect on uh, on the outcome in the London court. You can see that in the, the judges' decisions, who cites these allegations frequently and all over uh, her, her final ruling in Julian's case. Although she came to finally to the conclusion that he should not be extradited. So it did have an effect. Now, 10 days ago or so, or two weeks ago, uh, a, a prominent investigative journalist actually got back to this individual. They, they got access to chat logs and material that has not been previously, previously been investigated. And they sat down for hours and hours with that indiv individual. And in the end, he admitted that this was a total fabrication. It never happened. One would think that this would be enough to uh, throw out the case in London. It is evident now that the United States, UK courts, the magistrate court, was misled with these fabrications. And it had an effect. Uh, they do not have a lack to stand on in this case. It is shocking that we are actually seeing a continuation of the case in the appeal process in London, when all this has come forth. And it's not the only thing where the process has been abused when it comes to Julian Assange. Stella mentioned briefly here in the beginning, the spying in the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, Julian had, uh, was, was spied upon by a contractor who was working for the, the, the CIA indirectly, uh, recording conversations between him and his lawyers. Uh, material was stolen from the lawyers in the embassy, uh, defense documents. So through and through, this is such a horrendous attack on the rights of an individual. And it has gotten very little attention so far. And it needs to get more attention. People need to get, uh, be aware of, of how horrible Julian has been treated through and through, and how serious this case is for press freedom in general. I'm really happy for this uh, this uh, event to take place and, and to be a part of it. And I, I do I do have high hope for uh, the good people of Scotland to to come on board in, in large numbers. I uh, I spent a year in Edinburgh 20 years ago, and uh, I know from that experience uh, how uh, the the true nature of of, of your countrymen and uh, there is a, a strong sense of, of justice that I, I felt with, uh, with, uh, with, with the Scots. And, but we need everybody on board. We need, uh, and more and more people are coming on board. I mean, it's, it is the final push now. It's the end game, and it has to stop. We have cross-party groups from Australia uh, urging Biden to stop this. We have cross-party groups in the Bundestag in Germany, where I was last week. All parties except uh, alternative for Deutschland, which is basically a, a, a semi-fascist uh, political organization, were, are urging uh, Angela Merkel to take this up with Biden when, uh, when they meet uh, uh, in about 10 days. Uh, we have a cross-party group in, in, in London, and uh, we need politicians to come on board. We need people to come on board and care about this issue. Uh, and that is more and more happening. Uh, this has to come to an end, and it has to end very soon. The issue here is that I am worried about the Biden administration. The uh, spokesperson for uh, uh, the administration, or even uh, the, the Secretary of State uh, Blinken, has tried to hide behind this hollow argument that this is a, it's just a legal case. And they can't politically intervene. That is focus. That is that is that that is that is not uh, that is not enough. This was administered under the Trump administration as a politically motivated persecution, and you cannot allow this to continue. If you do, you're complicit. The only way to stop a political persecution is by politically intervening. It doesn't make sense to just shrug your shoulder and say, no, 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 this is just a legal case. It has to run its ground. 
So we have to have to consider that and put pressure on on Biden if he means anything about cleaning house and and uh, and changing the uh, um, change course from the Biden from the Trump legacy. This has to be an essential point of departure. They have to drop the case. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for those words and. Uh, it is worth pointing out that uh, David Davis, the Brexiteer and, and uh, Tory MP, did say that uh, Article 4 of the UK-US extradition treaty provides that extradition will not be granted for political offences. And uh, it's quite clear from what we've heard today, from what we know previously, that Assange's case is politically driven. But uh, we're nearing the end of, of this first meeting. I'm sure there'll be many more uh, coming up, but there's quite a few uh, questions that have um, come in. And what I would uh, like to do is to uh, throw these uh, to you. And if you can combine the answers and also the um, a concluding statement um, and, and if you can be as brief as, as possible as well. And um, starting uh, um, with Stella, uh, we've got it, um, somebody has made a, a question that I hate it when people use the phrase, it doesn't matter whether you like him or not. It should be banned from our mouths because what's not to like? It is a phrase that panders to the smearers. And, and there does seem to have been quite a, a smear campaign that uh, has been aimed at Julian. So if you can address that, um, Stella, uh, as well. And... Um, there's another one here uh, from Alison Mason saying, I hate that the Crown Prosecution Service sends the New York Times a press release on the appeal limited grounds and make it into the story that maybe Julian can serve his time in an Australian prison. And of course, um, this has been, she calls it a disgusting piece of journalism. So uh, you must be really dismayed as well, uh, Stella, and, and to the rest of the panel, about the quality of journalism that um, has emanated from uh, the extradition case. And uh, if you can also, uh, Stella, in your concluding remarks, just let us know how is Julian today, you know, how, um, how, how he is. And, and there are many other questions, but if we can address those and see how we do for time. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to begin with, I want to just, uh, you know, uh, remind everyone that all eyes will be on Scotland in just a few months time. The world's eyes will be on Scotland because of the COP26. And this is an incredible opportunity um, to, you know, influence the debate. Uh, world leaders will be coming uh, to Glasgow, I think. Uh, and so that's uh, an important event to, to, to be looking at in terms of, of mobilizing. Uh, Julian's case is absolutely a political case. And I fear sometimes when we do these um, uh, meetings that it gets too detailed. Uh, the big picture is that Julian is being persecuted He's a world-renowned journalist around the world. Lula da Silva in Brazil says that he should get the Nobel Peace Prize. He's being accused of the very same things that he's being nominated for to win the Nobel Peace Prize. It's that stark. Um, and uh, just quickly in relation to, to the, the news today, which is that the United States has uh, issued uh, what it says are um, undertakings in relation to Julian's prison conditions in the United States. Those undertakings are not worth the paper they are written on. Basically, they say that uh, he won't be sent to a specific supermax prison, but there are two dozen other supermax prisons that he could go to. Um, 
and they say that he wouldn't be placed under something called SAMS, which is basically uh, the very worst type of solitary confinement, solitary confinement times 10, they bury you alive, you can't speak to your family or your friends and your, and your lawyers aren't even uh, able to communicate how you are to the public or, or the situation in your case. So it's basically like dying. So they say they won't apply SAMS, except it's not enforceable because in fact, uh, they say in these assurances that they might change their mind once Julian is in the United States because they'll take advice from the head of the CIA in relation to SAMS. Um, and, you know, the CIA was behind the spying in the embassy, the plots to kill him, the targeting of our baby, uh, the spying on the lawyers' meetings and so on. So, of course, they're going to uh, want to put him on SAMS once he's in the United States. And the U.S. is notorious for breaking its assurances. So it's completely absurd. But let's take a step back again. We always have to take a step back. Julian is being in, put in prison. He is being persecuted. He is being prosecuted for being a journalist, for doing the most important journalism uh, in our generation. Uh, so this is absolutely uh, ridiculous that we're even talking about, oh, we can negotiate these prison conditions. He should not be in prison at all. Journalists should not be put in prison for doing their job. And I think we always need to come back to this. We need to get the big perspective, the big picture, and that's how we communicate it to the public um, because uh, the public doesn't need to understand the detail. It's good if people understand the detail, um, but the, the public in general doesn't need to know all the detail. It's the big picture that matters because uh, it's the big picture that is the threat to democracy and, and, and to journalism and to people's right to, to know. Right, thank you. Um, if, if I can now go uh, over to George, and uh, if, if you can be equally as uh, brief, George. Hello, have we got George there? There we go. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy to say that the uh, National Union of Journalists in the UK has indeed come out in uh, support of Julian and demanded that he is not extradited. And I think uh, for those of us who are working journalists, uh, one of the first important things to do uh, is to make use of that and get the, uh, the union to be more active, uh, and particularly on the whole issue of remand. One thing we can do, um, because it's difficult to override the judicial process, corrupt as it is, uh, one thing we can do is to uh, try and, and put pressure at that weak spot. Well, he's, nobody should be banged up on a man for two years without trial. I mean, that, is an, that is an outrage, uh, which I think most people will realise. So I think the union and politicians should begin to work away at that and get him out as, as rapidly as possible. Um, next, I think there is... A, there, 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 I'm disappointed with my fellow journalists in, in the UK. Um, it's almost as if they've been reticent uh, to make uh, public stories about uh, about this whole issue. And I appreciate it's, it's a very technical story and it's difficult to get across, but that's why we have um, reason journalism in this country. Uh, and there's not been way enough uh, investigation of, the, of, of this case uh, in the main print and TV journalism. Uh, so I think it's you know there's another case for for journalists to to step up to the plate and to start to talk to other journalists and make sure this becomes a much more public issue because that's the best defence um, that, that Julian has. Um, finally, um, I I'm, I'm, I think that the weak may be the Biden administration, which is trying to pretend um, that it's, it's a nice liberal. Uh, turn of page from from the mad Donald Trump. Um, of course, it isn't. It's it's in it's in the pay of, of, of American big business, and as American governments always are, uh, and will pursue American interests to the bitter end. Uh, and and uh, you know when Biden comes um, to to COP twenty six, his basic role is actually not to deal with climate change, but to get as much extra business for America. But here's the point: uh, if Biden's putting on a liberal face, we can use that. 
uh, to raise uh, the case for getting uh, the charges against uh, uh, Julian Assange dropped. Uh, so I think we should, again, those of us here who have access to, to media and through the journalists' uh, professions, we should be trying to put as much pressure to try and get um, uh, 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 liberal America, that's an inverted commas, by the way, uh, uh, to drop this case. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, thank you very much, George. And uh, Tommy, um, if, if you can uh, address the, also the issue of the demonization of Julian Assange and your concluding remarks as, as well. Yeah, sure. I, I think it was George and I both said it didn't really matter whether you like Julian Assange or not. That, that, that isn't the issue in this case. And I mean, I, 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 just to reassure the person who put it in the chat, I, I wasn't intending in, in saying that to give any sucker whatsoever to those who've been engaged in the demonization. Uh, and, and I respect completely Kristen and others uh, defending Julian's character. I was simply uh, saying that, that you know, there, there's, there's no point getting engaged in this argument with people about whether or not Julian Assange is a nice guy. That's really not what is at issue here. It's much, much more fundamental than that if we're to build a campaign. I mean, I think, you know, this country has become almost um, used over the over, over the last few decades to reports of, of quite momentous miscarriages of justices of justice with people being released from jail or their convictions overturned or whatever after the, the passage of time. What we have here, in effect, is an ongoing miscarriage of justice, which is actively sanctioned and supported by the, the British state and government, uh, as, as well as others around the world. And I think, you know, that we really need to, uh, to continue to point that out. I, I, and, and the thing that amazes me is, the, is the, almost the disconnect between the, the level of people who, on an intellectual level, say that, that this is ridiculous. And, uh, of, of course, there shouldn't, you know, there's no case to answer. The man should be free. And the scale of activity that there is behind pursuing that objective, and I, I think we we now need to try and you know put on, put people on the spot and say that it, it's not enough just to say you're against this. You have to do something about it now. And to, to finish, there was um, there was some stuff in the chat. Uh, I think from from Neil um, uh, in, in Oxford asking what the Scottish government is doing or whatever. I mean, I, I I don't speak for the Scottish government, and I and I in truth I I, I don't actually know. But I think there are, albeit limited, things that the Scottish Parliament can do to raise this, uh, and both within Scotland and, of course, as a component part of the United Kingdom as well, which is why it would be important to have the Scottish focus to this campaign. So if there's anyone on the on the call uh, who's resident in Scotland and who's got some time to to put into building a Scottish committee of the, of the campaign, uh, I'd be grateful if they could indicate you know, their the willingness to do so, so that we can take this forward and, and, and arrange more activity, particularly focused on the Scottish Parliament, uh, as we're able to do stuff physically uh, in, in that institution come the autumn. That's a, a brilliant idea, and I'm sure that um, people are working on it uh, as we speak. And finally, um, Kristen, if... Uh, if you can add your comments as well and you know what can we do to protect investigative journalism well i'll be i'll be brief here i mean we we do have to recognize the value of investigative journalism we do so you know regularly in in uh, in flowery words uh, but uh, we don't often uh, uh, step to the plate and, and actually take action to support uh, investigative journalists uh, who are revealing the truth, uh, as Julian Assange did, as Wikileaks has been doing. And, uh, uh, and I'm hoping, and I'm really thankful for taking part in this, and I'm really hoping that, uh, uh, that we will get a good support in Scotland to the campaign and I'm helping, I hope I'll, I'm willing to contribute in any, any way that I can. Uh, but uh, in essence, people just need to show the support and show up uh, and, and, and show up in numbers. So uh, that is the only thing that, uh, that the, the power recognized. It is numbers of people who basically show up 
and uh, raise their fist and say enough is enough. And in this case, certainly enough is enough. And let's use any opportunity that uh, that comes up to, to do that. Uh, the, the, the COP, the COP, uh, and, and other events. Um, because so much is at stake, uh, as and as Sela said, the, the, the fundamental is here. It's a persecution of an individual and a grave and a very serious attack on press freedom. It is being recognized by more and more people. Uh, so be on the right side of history, take part. And thank you, Tommy and George and, and you, Yvonne, for this event. Well, thank you uh, very much, Kristen, and, and also to our other panellists who've all made excellent points and uh, to people who've contributed in the chat. Um, I've just been told that uh, there's already a group called Scots uh, Defend Assange and they've got a, a Facebook uh, page. So um, it would be good to, to see what they're up to. And, and um, Tommy's idea, you know, let's, as I say, I'm sure that people are talking about doing something constructive now and, and um, involving the Scottish Parliament, which is, you know, the, the government uh, in Scotland is seen as being progressive. And you, thank you, everybody. I'm, apologies for allowing the meeting to overrun um, by about... 15 minutes, but really um, the, all the speeches from the panelists were uh, all well made. And it is the inaugural meeting in, um, in Scotland of uh, DEA, Don't Extradite Assange. There will be uh, follow-up meetings of that, um, you can be certain. And so to everyone tonight who's taken part, um, thank you so much and uh, love and, and solidarity to, uh, to Stella, says Shona Davidson. That just flipped up on my uh, timeline there. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, we will um, meet again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.